My name is Dr. Tlaleg Mufugeng. I'm the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right of Everyone to the Highest Attainable Standard of Physical and Mental Health. My report is titled Drug Policies and Responses, a Right to Health Framework on Harm Reduction. Harm reduction is a way of an approaching um, the issue of drug use and people who may have drug dependencies and of course in the different ways that emergence in health systems. I came into this work through the HIV lanes around hepatitis, needle exchange programs, but for the right to health, it's absolutely about human rights. It's about protecting the dignity of people, including people who use drugs and not discriminate them. And so the report aims to bring about an analysis that looks at the impact of current policies and practices and proposes through the right to health framework of accessible, affordable, acceptable and quality health how we can shift the paradigm from a war on drugs to harm reduction that looks at information giving, at seeking behavior and health seeking behavior, as well as is ensuring that programs are really centered around the needs of people who use drugs without stigma. Criminalization is one of the biggest impacts that we see in terms of drugs and the thematic area of drug use. Criminalization enables other human rights violations to happen, even within the health system, where you find that a drug user may have, in one instance, a particular crisis. They may come to a health facility for something completely different, but by disclosing that they are using particular drugs, which are often termed illicit drugs, the stigma and the discrimination then tends to, to come forward. Um, in some jurisdictions, in some countries, doctors are being forced to actually report people who are drug users. And so it's important to understand that criminalization as a legal framework enables actually this idea that people who use drugs need to be surveilled, need to be policed, um, and that they don't actually have particular rights around the right to health. So I used the entryway of criminalization to really understand um, and to illustrate how law and medicine can intersect. But there's also the positive where law and medicine can intersect, where legal frameworks can enable the respect, the promotion of the right to health. I want to acknowledge and say thank you to all of the people who did respond to the call for submission for my report. It's very important for me as a mandate holder to acknowledge that and get a variety of views and lived experiences, especially when it comes to drug policies and programs, but more importantly about how it affects rights holders. My work is always centered around the restoration of dignity. And a lot of the best practices that are highlighted in the report are aimed to give member states and other stakeholders and UN agencies an idea of how to move forward, understanding that dignity of people is really, really important. So we have in some instances really great examples around community mobilization, around the use of digital media for information and uh, patient health information. We also have examples around actual responses in terms of clinical care around, you know, having an Alexone um, available to reverse some of the overdoses that we see. We have really great example and we all understand the needle exchange program. Often when you say harm reduction, people think needle exchanges, but we've also seen how research is actually quite um, uh, dynamic in how they are able to actually tell us in which population is which drugs more prevalent and therefore the response of the health system is more tailored. What's also fascinating in this report in terms of good practices is that we meet people where they are and the examples in some countries where you have non-governmental organizations who are able to provide test strips for patient, uh, clients, people who are going to festivals, cultural clubs, where we know that um, drug use is going to happen. And people can test, firstly, what it is that they have in their possession. They can test the quality of that. And I think for me, it's really a good step in the right direction. When people are empowered with knowledge, they can make informed decisions around their health, including drug use, whether to use them, whether not to use them. But if you're going to use them, what are the safety measures and protections that you need to be thinking for yourself?
So the right to health is more than about just accessing health facilities. It speaks also very intentionally and very inclusively about underlying determinants of health. And so the recommendations I make in this report, particularly to member states, first and foremost, are grounded, of course, in the human rights obligations that they have to respect and fulfill and to promote the right to health. And in the context of harm reduction and drug use, I'm saying to them, and I'm, and I'm pleading to them almost, to abandon this war on drugs and to shift the, the paradigm to harm reduction. And I've given them some ideas around policy changes that can possibly get us there. I've given and thought deeply about what it means for clients to be able to access quality care, what that looks like for people who may not necessarily live even in urban spaces. I've also, of course, tried to speak to them around resourcing and budgeting. We know a lot of these programs depend on other aid or other um, resource support, and it's not often sustainable. So it's very, under, it's very important for member states to understand that harm reduction and the issues of drug use uh, are not um, stigmatized and that we should be integrating in a comprehensive way services. Of course, I speak about the intersections of mental health. I also speak about sex work. I also speak about young people who use drugs. And it's important to also understand that people who use drugs have very colorful, varied lives as well. And they are professionals doing many other different things. And for me, it's my hope through those recommendations that we can destigmatize, but ultimately decriminalize. The ultimate call for me is that UN member states must decriminalize drug use. The war on drugs has a particular political history and a timeline. Um, and when one interrogates the idea that a war on drugs became this international global movement, you know, like with many other situations, there is a disproportionate impact of that kind of heavy policing, surveilling, punishing, detainment of people. And it always goes down the same lines, racial lines, gendered, um, people who are minorities. And so even with the war on drugs, I see it as a war on people. The war on drugs is a war on people. Drugs don't consume themselves. It's people who need them. And by the way, the war on drugs is a hypocritical way of framing this because I'm a medical doctor. I'm also a patient. I'm also on prescription medication for many, many of my own chronic pain and chronic illnesses. And my pain and my illness is deemed okay and acceptable because a medic has said as such. But you have a lot of people who are also not believed in the health system, who are not able to access the right formulation of the right medication that they require. And they actually do end up self-medicating. So we cannot punish people again for having particular ailments or having particular needs going into the process of self-medicating, unsure themselves what's happening, and then we punish them because they are, they are using drugs. So there is something to be said about the approach, but also the fact that that policing and surveilling and detainment of people is very much still racialized. And so for me, the war on drugs has to stop and end. There is no place for it currently, even in our future. And we need to rethink deeply about how we center human rights holders um, in this conversation. We must listen to what people need. We must listen to what people want. And the war on drugs is a war on people ultimately. And that's incompatible with the right to health. Decriminalization remains one of the most important legal steps that all the member states can take immediately. When you are living under a criminalized state, whether it's because of your health status or whether you use drugs or whether you have a, uh, a irregular migratory status, whatever the issue of discrimination or whatever the issue has been used to criminalize you, it's very hard to imagine a life where you can thrive outside of that. And criminalization right now limits all of our imagination as policymakers, as experts, as doctors, as clinicians, as communities, as NGOs, because you are constantly at conflict with the law. And we need to decrease and remove that level of being in conflict with the law because it is a manufactured layer 
of conflict with the law. Decriminalization will therefore allow us in different jurisdictions, in different regions, in different countries, in different districts, all the way to the community level, for people to actually determine for themselves what is a human rights-based policy that supports harm reduction? What do services that are sustainable and dignified look like for us in our context? Cultural practices. We know a lot um, around spirituality and mental health and all of those different um, intersections. So with, with decriminalization, we allow all of us to be innovative and to really think without the pressure or the threat of being incarcerated or being stigmatized or being discriminated against. And decriminalization is important because it will enable drug users, either past, present, even future drug users, to have gainful employment. Because right now, the discrimination affects their economic participation. The discrimination affects their ability to get into schools. It affects their ability to participate fully in society. And so the right to health as a framework, if we get it right, if we end the war on drugs, we move to harm reduction, we decriminalize. It offers an opportunity to holistically once and for all, respond in a human rights-based manner to this issue.